Hey there everyone, my name is Luke and welcome to my channel. Tonight I'm out here with the telescope and I'm really excited to show a new bit of kit that I've just bought for myself. It's the Player One Neptune C2. Now I just want to get this right out of the way at the beginning and let you know that this isn't a sponsored review or anything like that. I'm not sponsored by anybody. I bought this camera with my own money and all the thoughts that you're going to hear in this kind of review first look are just my own thoughts. So the Neptune C2 is the only astro camera on the market with an IMX 464 sensor in it, which is actually the big brother to the very popular IMX 462, which is used really rather successfully as a planetary camera, and sometimes some people use it for EAA and things like that. The only difference between these two sensors is that the IMX 464 is physically two times the area of the 462. So the sensor itself uses 2.9 micron pixels and it's got 4.2 million of them jammed onto this little sensor which is I think 7.9 by 4.5 millimeters across and of course it shares that same incredible infrared sensitivity for those people who want to utilize that kind of thing uh, maybe in infrared imaging of planets and such or even infrared imaging of galaxies which is also a possibility. Now onto the design of the camera and what you see when you open the box and basically the first thing you're going to notice is how well built it is I think. Uh, I was really impressed right from getting it into my hand that first time. I quite like that hexagonal shape, um, it does make judging rotation quite easy when you can kind of eye up a flat edge across the base plate of your focuser at least on my Newtonian and things like that. Uh, and that kind of hexagonal shape also means if you put it down on something it's not so easily going to roll off. Overall though, in general, the, the entire fit and finish of the whole package I think is really good. It's got kind of a sandblasted, anodized type of finish to it and it just feels really premium in your hands. Uh, one other thing that I noticed which is quite nice is that when you kind of touch the uh, USB and SD4 connectors and try and give them a little wobble, they're extremely stable on the motherboards. So there's no like wobbly connectors or anything like that, it's all totally solid. So another really nice feature that they put on these cameras is basically every single one of the planetary and solar range that they sell, they all have a tilt adjustment faceplate, which means that if you're getting like Newton rings, as I understand when you're solar imaging, that can be a problem and you need to deliberately tilt the sensor. Or indeed, if you're just DSO imaging and things like that, and you notice there's, there's some tilt happening, you can correct it all with the faceplate. I haven't needed to touch mine. It's came from factory just perfectly flat. So that's a good thing. But Basically, I think this should be included on lots more cameras. It's such a handy thing to have and it just saves you having to buy an external tilting adapter. Now, another nice feature that they decided to include on this, uh, which is not really that often seen on a planetary camera, at least as far as I know, is that they've included a 256 megabyte memory buffer on board. Now, Usually you'd have to invest in quite a lot more of an expensive camera to start to see this thing um, included in the price, but this is on all the planetary cameras and indeed the solar cameras too. And I think it's a really neat addition. It helps just kind of smooth out any frame transfer issues. Uh, let's say if the camera's taking frames faster than the computer can accept them, it'll start to fill that buffer and basically it'll do as it describes. It'll give it kind of a buffer. Another interesting thing, uh, at least I think it is, uh, that it has, is it has a dead pixel suppression technology kind of built in. Um, it's not something that you can turn off in the drivers or anything like that, at least not as far as I've seen. So you can't really judge the benefit for yourself, basically by turning it off and on and running tests with or without. But I would say that for an uncooled camera, there's a very low amount of kind of hot or cold pixels and stuck pixels and things like that. So I would wager on the fact that it is working as intended.
Now, those of you quite familiar with CMOS technology will no doubt be wondering how is the amp glow on this chip? And basically I've ran some tests already that were just run indoors, so at quite a high temperature, I think uh, the sensor got to about 28 degrees while I was messing around taking these captures and the house is about 22. So it gained a few degrees as is to be expected on an uncooled camera, but here's basically what I found. So in video footage, like you'd use for planetary work, you can consider the sensor to have basically no amp glow at all. Now in short exposures from about one to 10 seconds, you can consider it from having almost no amp glow whatsoever to having just a very minor glow, uh, mostly concentrated in just the bottom right of the frame. So in slightly longer exposure tests, ranging from about 10 up to around 60 seconds was where I finished my own testing. It basically showed that the amp glow grows linearly over time. So that is to say that longer exposures are gonna have more glow. I'm really happy to say that the amp glow calibrates out perfectly. So it seems to me, uh, at least in every test image that I've taken so far, and I'm out here doing it again tonight, and just live stacking with on the fly, flat and dark subtraction. There's absolutely no visible amp glow in these frames. So it's working perfectly. And those of you who know CMOS sensors by now are probably gonna be well aware of the fact that there's only really a handful of sensors and they tend to be quite highly priced that are completely free of amp glow and every other sensor on the market has to deal with it too. So it's nothing unexpected or really it shouldn't be marked down in any way for the inclusion of amp glow. It's just a normal feature on these Sony IMX sensors. Now, one other thing worth mentioning before I head off inside and just wait for these stacks to complete for a while is about the driver install procedure. So basically it was completely painless. I just went to the Player One website. I downloaded both the native and the ASCOM driver installed both of them and it just worked straight away, right out of the box. No pain whatsoever. I haven't had a single problem with disconnects or anything like that. It all just works, which honestly I can really value. I think that's extremely impressive that player one have managed to get these drivers to a really seemingly extremely mature point where uh, I'm just not worried about them. I can just get on with using the camera and enjoying it. I'm happy to say it works absolutely fine in SharpCap and the other software I tested it in just for a little while to see if it would connect and take frames and things was Nina uh, and that worked absolutely fine too. You do have to use the ASCOM driver I think in Nina as it doesn't have native support yet. I guess since it's such a new company and new camera but still SharpCap quite happily uses the uh, native drivers and you get incredibly high frame rates. Um, they market it as being able to take I think 93 frames a second at full resolution and I thought that's pretty high for a 4.2 megapixel camera but sure enough it achieves 93 frames a second. I've tested it, it does work, it's pretty awesome. Now I've had one other session with this camera so far and it unfortunately didn't last long before I got clouded out but what I did manage to capture while using the 250 PDS and the Optolong L Extreme filter is I aimed it at the horse's head and I was using 10 second exposures to capture narrowband footage and honestly it turned out quite a lot better than I was expecting to see. I did it as kind of almost a bit of a silly test just to see if you could stack those 10 second narrowband exposures and it worked out really quite well. This is what 50 minutes looked like. I'll just show it for you now on the screen. Fortunately, tonight looks like it's gonna be a much better night and I'm gonna get a much longer period of imaging under my belt. So I've decided I'm gonna park it on one target, as you may have seen on the laptop screen there behind me. I'm just live stacking images of the Crab Nebula. These are 20 second long exposures and I'm basically just resetting it every 10 minutes that passes to make almost like a sub frame that I can take all those frames afterwards and stack them together after the fact. Now there's quite a strong moon up in the sky tonight and it's not ideal, but beggars certainly can't be choosers and I'm gonna take any clear night that I can get at this point. And really I'm just hoping to bring you a nice result and let's see how it can stack these 20 second narrowband exposures when given a proper chance over the course of a few hours.
Well, a few hours have passed now and I've been keeping an eye on things inside and I did notice that the star brightness was starting to kind of tail off and I thought what could be causing this is the perhaps high cloud. There is a little bit which initially fooled me but eventually I decided to take a look down the end of the scope and it looked like the primary mirror was just starting to get maybe a very light layer of condensation forming on it. So I had to kind of think on my feet and figure out a solution as fast as possible as I don't want to waste it's lovely clear night, so I ran off upstairs to where I keep my Esprit 120, uh, which has actually got a hugely too big dew strap attached to it. It's actually meant for an 11 inch Schmidt gas grain scope. So I've kind of rubbed that off my Esprit and I've taken it and put it onto this. And now I'm powering that with the same power output that I was using for the fan. And it seems to all be working great now. Um, I left it kind of 10 minutes or so to acclimate itself and double check focus and make sure there'd been no tube expansion due to that little bit of heat being put into it and uh, basically it all seems absolutely fine now and that little bit of frosting on the primary mirror has dissipated thankfully so it looks like we're set to continue on shooting well into the night as long as the weather holds anyway. Well, I think I'd just like to wrap things up now by saying I hope that you've enjoyed the video and honestly, thank you so much for watching. It's thanks to all the support from you guys out there that I'm able to continue doing things like this and I really am grateful for the opportunity. So honestly, thank you. And I think with that said, that about wraps everything up. So until next time, I hope that you've enjoyed and clear skies.